Welcome to Church in Region Park. Thank you for joining us tonight. We are starting in a series called Stay Strong. Let praise be a weapon, the silence is the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. And it changes everything. We sing with the we are when we claim your victory. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. For fear cannot survive.
And every war he wages, he will win. I'm not backing down from any giants. Cause I know how this story ends. I know how this story ends. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. Sing it out for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see, I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. You take, you take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good you turn it for good cause I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle below.
in the darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from the throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt you tonight. God, that forever we can bow in your presence. God, that you are so worthy and so holy. God, we just want to praise your name, Lord, even right now in this moment. God, thank you that you are the King of kings. God, that you are the Lord of lords. And Lord, we're so thankful. God, that you sent your Son because you loved us so deeply. God, that you thought of each and every one of us, Lord. God, it cost an enormous price. But you sent your son because you loved us. And God, for that, we give you thanks. We give you praise tonight. God, you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. God, you rule in our hearts. In your holy name. Amen. We're going to continue our worship tonight with virtual communion and I hope uh, you have a chance to uh, grab some juice and uh, something that represents Christ's body and what my hope is that there's some good that comes out of this tragic loss that some of us have experienced that all the discomfort and the 
loss of life that's taken place uh, in our world that I don't know if you've noticed, but people seem to be more concerned about each other, that people are checking in on each other, that even acquaintances that I have had are asking, how are you doing? How is your family doing? That every conversation begins with, are you well? Are you safe? Is there anything I can do? I've been encouraged by even celebrities and athletes have been given back and giving of their means to help others, that organizations have, have changed their primary manufacturing goods and they've begun to make masks and, and supported frontline workers. And so one of the positives in all of this tragedy is people are more concerned about each other. One of our community heroes in Regent Park is Serge Abaka, who stepped up and has donated $100,000 to Fred Victor, that others would match his donation and that he would match uh, all the contributions that come in up to $100,000. And that is an amazing feat. And we're so thankful that, that he has been involved in the taste of, of Regent Park, that he has been involved in, in other programming at Fred Victor at the CRC, which Church in Regent Park rents on Saturdays and uses on Wednesdays for our Bible studies. And we're thankful for, for people like Serge that have given of themselves to help others. And it reminded me of what John writes in 1 John 3.16. He says, this is how we have come to know love that Jesus laid down his life for us. We should also lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has this world's goods and sees his brother and sister in need, but shuts them off his compassion from him, how can God's love reside in them? Friends, Jesus showed us what love is, that he laid down his life for us and he encourages us to take some time to remember what he sacrificed for us that we would give our lives back to him with gratitude and said Jesus thank you for setting me free thank you for opening up the way to relationship with God thank you for laying your life down and as a result I'm going to lay my life down and I'm going to help my brothers and sisters in need especially in crisis, especially where people are suffering in their finances, especially when people that don't have enough to eat or have lost their loved ones, that I'm going to see how I can help. And so as we move to taking the emblems together, why don't we just think about how Christ showed us what love is. We're going to take the juice and we're going to take a piece of bread that symbolizes Jesus broken body and we're going to take part in a tradition that Christians have been doing for 2,000 years Paul writes about something that he received from Jesus himself he says in verse 23 of chapter 11 for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you on the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and said, This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so let's take this bread, which is representative of Jesus' body that was broken and nailed on a cross for us. In the same way, Jesus also took the cup after supper and said, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's take the cup and proclaim the Lord's death until he returns again. Joe, do you mind just closing our time of communion in prayer tonight? Yeah. Lord God, we just, uh, we just thank you for this time that we have to, um, 
reflect on you and just to be thankful, Lord, for for showing us that example of love, Lord. And Father, we just thank you during these times we see that love continuing in our communities, in in this province, in this country, and during this time of COVID, Lord. And Father, we just we just continue to pray that you continue to have your hand upon us all and continue to walk through these streets and walk through these buildings, Lord, and just make your presence known, Lord. And Father, that you would just continue to hold up those and provide for those that are in need. And Father, we just thank you and we just praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Joe. If you need prayer, if there's anything we can do to help you, then you can email us at, at prayer at CIRPToronto.ca or call us at 416-756-9509. We're here for you and we want to stand with you in prayer. Good evening. Thanks for joining us tonight, church. We hope you're doing well. And if there's anything we can do to help, you can email us at info at CIRPToronto.ca. You can reach out and leave us a message at 416-756-9509. We're here for you. For you, thank you for your financial support as we continue to uh, play an essential service <laughs> in Regent Park. We're feeding 300 people every Saturday night, and you can... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> And stay strong. Hi, Church of Regent Park. It's Ashton. And I hope you're all staying safe and staying home. And that all I want to tell you is stay strong. Hey, Church of Regent Park. Hope you're all staying home and staying healthy. Uh, I hope Corona ends soon so we can get back and see you. And this message is about staying strong. My name is Mark, and I have the privilege of leading this amazing church that meets normally at 40 Oak Street in Regent Park. And we're going to continue with the new series that we have entitled Stay Strong. We wrapped up five weeks focusing on where is God when it hurts. And I hope you understand that, that God loves you and cares about you, that he is all loving, he is all powerful, and evil exists because he desires relationship with us, that we would choose to be in relationship with him. And we're on our way to the best world possible when Jesus returns and he creates a new heaven and a new earth that we're going to live forever without evil, without pain, without suffering. Maybe you've heard the term, stay strong. When I looked it up on Instagram, there was 14 million pictures that had the hashtag, stay strong. On TikTok, 800,000 videos had the hashtag, stay strong. Tonight, we're going to start by finding out how we can find strength when we are weak. Sometimes in our culture, we celebrate those who don't seek out help, who are independent, who have succeeded without the help of others. But when we look at scripture, we see the strong seek out help. Jesus modeled the importance of, of seeking out help. That he reached out to his father in the most difficult moments. But he also made a regular practice of sneaking away from the crowds, getting away from his disciples and meeting with God, seeking out help, seeking out wisdom. And part of the reason he did that was to model its importance to us. Michael Phelps is the most celebrated Olympian of all time. He's won 28 medals. He has a number of different Olympic records. There is no question that he is the best and strongest Olympian of all time. But he also struggles with mental 
illness. And he's very, been very open and authentic about it. And on May 18th on ESPN, he was interviewed about this. And he said, you know, this pandemic has been one of those most difficult times in his life. He said he tried to internalize it. He tried to hold it in. But he got to the point where he lost his temper. He just could not handle it anymore. He attributes his ability to to come through it through his wife and, and to his family. And, and he speaks out because it encourages others. He's actually donated 500 hours to a charity that's making themselves available to support frontline workers who may be struggling with PTSD or, or depression. And friends, the strongest Olympian ever sees the need to reach out for help. We're going to look at the Apostle Paul and one of his struggles. He was a great leader, but he faced some opposition. He faced some criticism. And he writes the second letter to Corinthians to a church that is being divided. That there is a group of, of leaders there who are encouraging the non-Jews to begin to take on some of the Jewish dietary laws of the Old Testament. And, and Paul says it shouldn't be. And as a result, this other group of leaders, they begin to criticize him. They say, Paul, you're, you're double-minded. You're too authoritative. You have no letters of reference. You're an imposter. Your letters are too hard to understand. You refuse to accept our financial help likely because you feel guilty because you're an imposter and all these criticisms are levied at Paul and then we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 on how he chooses to respond to this criticism he says I must go on boasting although there's nothing to be gained I will go on to the visions and revelations from the Lord I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, whether it was in his body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself except about my weaknesses. Even if I should to boast, I would not be a fool, because I would be speaking the truth, but I refrain. So no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say, or because of these surpassing great revelations. And so Paul is being criticized, and he has to walk a fine line. He doesn't want to come across arrogant and boastful, and boast about the letters and the great experiences he's had, but in the same sense, he, he sees something that needs to be corrected. He doesn't want this church to be led astray. Strength isn't found in sharing your exploits. This other group of leaders, they're often referred to as the Judaizers, were anxious to receive honors, and they boasted about their letters of recommendation. They claimed that their eloquence and their knowledge was a mark of their authority they boasted about their visions and their revelations their healing miracles their letters of reference their willingness to receive financial support because they had earned it they boasted about their palestinian origin and they were being disciples of Jesus. But God often spoke to Paul as well through visions. That's how he met Jesus in the first place. He had a vision of Ananias coming to lay hands on him and receiving his sight. He had visions, but when he was called to minister to the non Jews, he had a vision for Macedonia. He received a vision from God when it was difficult in Corinth. He had a vision about, well, he was arrested in Jerusalem and he was encouraged by God. He received a vision of an angel 
that appeared to him in the midst of the storm and assured him that he and his passengers would not lose their lives, but they would be saved. And that came to pass. And so Paul could have gladly boasted about all the visions he had, but he chooses not to do so. In fact, he refers to a man in Christ who had a vision 14 years earlier. Well, we understand that this was Paul, but, but he seeks to put all the focus on Christ. And he humbly says, you know, uh, in Christ, Christ was the one that brings about these visions. It's not any good that he had done as a humble servant of Jesus. But he talks about this vision. He wasn't sure if it happened just in his mind or if he was physically transported to heaven. Scholars have, have studied the use of heaven in the Old Testament and in the New, and they believe that the first heaven takes place between the earth and the clouds, and the second heaven is where the stars exist, and the third heaven is where God lives. This may be what Paul means when he says he was caught up to the third heaven. And something happened there that was inexpressible in words, and he was not permitted to tell. Maybe he learned some things that were just for him alone to know. Or maybe God instructed him not to share anything about this vision. But regardless, Paul had an amazing spiritual encounter. Paul has a huge list of credentials and many supernatural experiences. And he could have boasted about these, but instead he chooses to boast about his weaknesses. And he reveals why he chooses to answer these Judaizers. He chooses to respond back, not by boasting at his individual accomplishments, but instead about what Jesus has accomplished in him. And we're going to look at the final number of verses in 2 Corinthians. Paul continues and he says, Therefore, in order to keep me from being conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in my weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions and difficulties, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Recognizing that he is human and that all of these amazing, genuine spiritual experiences may lead Paul to become prideful. He points it out, he says, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, he recognizes that God allowed a messenger from Satan to torment him, to harass him. Now, Satan is not all-knowing. Satan is not all-powerful. Satan has actually already been defeated, and his time is short. He has limited power, and God allowed him to try and knock Paul off course. He tried to, to keep Paul from fulfill, fulfilling his mission Paul recognizes that pride has the potential to take him out of God's plans for our world. And he didn't want that to happen. Pride has the ability to knock all of us out of God's plans. Pride comes before a fall, the Bible tells us. And I came across a study done by a professor from the College of London and Columbia University, his name is Thomas Chamorro Prismusic. And he studied those that have a high self-confidence and compared it to the success of those that have a lower self-confidence. And he found out three different things. That those with lower self-confidence pay attention to negative feedback and are self-critical. Those with lower self-confidence motivate themselves to work harder and prepare more. Those with lower self-confidence reduce the chances of coming across as arrogant or being deluded. Those that have a high self-confidence are actually less 
successful than those leaders who have a lower self-confidence. Paul recognized that pride could knock him off course. God allowed a thorn in Paul's flesh not to punish Paul or not to control him, but to keep him on track, to remind Paul that dependence on God is where his strength lies. Paul's strength is not in his wealth of experience. It's not in his scholarly accomplishments. It's not in his spiritual encounters, although he had many. His strength lies in his reliance on God. This thorn in the flesh, there's been lots of discussion over the centuries about what exactly it was. Whether it was a temptation to fear or doubt, or a temptation to sin, or maybe it was opposition and persecution that Paul faced. But the word thorn, it actually means a sharp stake used for torture or impaling. It sounds like a physical ailment. Something physical that caused him pain. Epilepsy was one possibility. Others, the early church fathers felt like maybe he had malaria and one of the symptoms of malaria is intense headaches. I personally believe it was an eye issue because we read in Galatians 4, verses 14 to 15. He says, even though my illness was a trial to you, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. I can testify that if you could have done so, you would have torn out my eyes and given them to me. Well, why would they desire to tear out, tear out their eyes, except that, that Paul's illness was related to his eyes. We also read in Galatians 6.11 that Paul refers to the large light letters that he writes with his own hand. But whatever this issue was, whatever this thorn is, it was clear that it prevented him from physically doing everything he wanted to do from time to time that it was a bit of an issue and kept him from fulfilling his responsibilities. Friends, Scripture isn't just historical accounts, but Scripture is just as relevant to you and me today. And I feel that maybe one of the reasons we don't know what this thorn is is because we might be tempted to, to distance ourselves from the application of this passage in our lives. That if we knew what this thorn was, we'd say, oh, that was Paul's issue. But I don't have any thorns, or I don't need to apply this to my life. Paul prays three times that God would take it away. But God chooses to answer Paul's prayer differently. Paul quotes God's answer, that God answers God's prayer. Maybe not the answer that Paul expected but he says, my grace is sufficient for you, Paul, for my power is made perfect in weakness. The word grace, it means kindness. It means undeserved favor. And the word sufficient, it means possessing enough strength. God says, my, my undeserved kindness, my undeserved favor enables you to possess enough strength to overcome this thorn, Paul. God's grace was enough to help Paul survive a shipwreck and encourage all the passengers that were wrecked with him. It enabled him to overcome incarceration. God's grace helped him when he was whipped, when he was lied about. It was sufficient when he was chased out of towns and overcome with the guilt and pain of watching People die before he met Jesus and ruining people's lives. God's grace was sufficient for Paul when he faced death himself. Friends, God's grace is enough for us when we face our challenges. When you face isolation, when you have been separated from your church, from your family and friends, when you have lost loved ones, as tragic as that is, that God's kindness is sufficient, is enough to help you overcome. Instead of removing the discomfort, God says, I will give you the strength 
to carry it. I do believe that God heals. Two weeks ago, we prayed for a member of our church that was in hospital, and the doctors weren't sure why their organs weren't working, and we prayed, and a week later, we received a call from this person. I saw him last Saturday, and he said, I've been healed. The doctors can't completely understand why my organs began to function again, but I'm thankful for your prayers. But in Paul's case, God says, Paul, I'm not going to take it away. I'm going to give you the strength to overcome this thorn. If God removed every challenge we faced, how would we ever grow in our strength? If God took every adversity that we faced away, then how would our faith be strengthened? How do we learn to depend on him? I've been watching the Lance, the Last Dance documentary, and I guess, I don't know if I feel any differently about Michael Jordan, but I guess what was my biggest takeaway was how hard the NBA, the NBA was to play in back in those battles with the Pistons, that they had decided that any time Jordan was about to jump, to knock him over, to hit him, to bang him, and they found the way to beat the Bulls was to knock them around and push them around. And it worked for a time until the Bulls grew in their strength and their tenacity. Until they recognized what the Pistons were trying to do. And they overcame it. That battle testing led to six championships. They were able to beat the Pistons. They were able to beat the Knicks that tried to play them the same way. And because they didn't give up, because they battled through it, they grew in their strength, and it led them to six championships. Adversity, hardship, that God can give us the strength to overcome it and prepare us to grow and to be an encouragement to others. Verse 9 says, Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. Because God's grace, Paul will not boast about his own strength or accomplishments or spiritual experiences. He will share about his thorns, his shipwrecks, the chains, his violent past, the hurts he felt. Because the spotlight is not on him but on Christ. He delights in weaknesses and in insults and hardships and persecutions and difficulties because they are an opportunity to show how Christ has saved him, has changed him, and strengthened him. His weaknesses, his challenges lead others toward how good God is. Not everyone that Paul interacted with attended the same elite schools. Not everyone got to travel the world like Paul. Very few people had visions and encounters on the level that Paul did. But everyone can relate with Paul's weaknesses. When Paul opens up and shares about his defeats, about those times he was hurt, about the times he was insulted, that people can relate to that. And they can recognize that Christ can help them in their weakness. That Christ can come in and help them in their time of need. He finishes by saying, For when I am weak, then I am strong. We find supernatural strength, grace that is sufficient when we come to the place where we realize that we can't make it without Jesus. That when we are weak, we realize that we find supernatural strength. Grace that is enough for us to overcome anything. I want to close with this amazing quote from an American Anglican leader. His name was Philip Brooks. He said, do not pray for easy lives. Pray to be stronger people. Do not pray for tasks equal to your powers. 
pray for powers equal to your tasks, then doing of your work shall be no miracle, but you shall be the miracle. Friends, sometimes God performs the miracle. Sometimes God performs miraculous healing. Sometimes God miraculously eases the hardship and the challenges that we face. But there are other times when you become the miracle. When God helps you overcome. When God gives you supernatural strength. When God's grace is enough to help you overcome. Because he gets the glory. Because people's eyes are on him. Paul could boast about weaknesses and insults and all of these things. Because he wanted Christ to get the glory. And friends, your strength is found in coming to Jesus and giving him your life and allowing him to put a spotlight on how he's strengthening you and using you. Even in difficult times, even when we face historic challenges that our generation has never seen, stay strong because Christ is on your side. And when you are weak, you recognize that you depend on an all-powerful God who is ready to work on your behalf. Let's sing this final closing song together. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. Every war he wages, he will win. I'm not backing down from any giants. I know how this story ends. I know how this story ends. as we as we go out this week father lord that our faith would be strengthened lord god that we would believe in your miracles father and lord that we would be willing to be a miracle for you lord that we would give our lives completely
completely surrender to you, Father. Lord, I just pray a blessing on um, this church, Lord. I pray a blessing on our viewers. God, I just ask that you would continue to work in our lives and uh, that you would help us to grow closer to you each day, Father. Thank you for all of this. Thank you for the message. 